the biggest lesson learned, I think, was we don't go out in daytime. Just to put it in comparison, we're talking about a city with 300,000 people in it. Even in Afghanistan, it's remote. It was, that's like fighting on the moon. It's just remote. But Iraq was a very well-developed, mature country. Yeah. And, and you know these people, had, they didn't have anywhere to go. And you never knew who the enemy was either. That was, that was a really big challenge for us. But in Ramadi, the ROEs were very permissive. If they're driving, shoot them. If they're digging, shoot them. They're out at night, shoot them. And everybody in the town knew that. And it, wherever the hottest resistance was, that's where we went. And yeah, I was, um, there's, a, there's a lot of guys that got hit. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 24 years as a major, not all that time as a major, but in the United States Marine Corps. He conducted 10 deployments to areas such as Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Horn of Africa. He's the author of Echo and Ramadi. He's the executive director of Save the Brave, which is a really great nonprofit that connects vets struggling with PTSD uh, with uh, appropriate out outreach programs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Major Scott Husing. Thanks for having me, Mike. Did I pronounce your name right? Got it. Nailed it. Good. Um, what uh, What does your, your normal daily uh, morning routine look like uh, on a day that you're in town? <clears throat> well, I'm a California boy. and uh, Still? Yes, still. I'm eagerly awaiting the California legislature to stop taxing yeah. retirement. Well, hold your breath on that. I know. I'm, I'm waiting. And I'm yeah. always being actively recruited to move to Texas, which I love. I yeah. love it. Down, I'm down, I've been down here every month this year. Oh, really? Doing something, either <clears throat> speaking engagement or a lot of work with the nonprofit sector. And uh, the culture down here is great. Yeah. Weather's not that great. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it, I uh, it. yeah, I mean, if, if you like extreme temperatures and in, in both directions, Texas is awesome. Yeah. But, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's extreme cold in the winter, but it's cold enough for it to suck. Um, you know, it's not cold the way it is like in uh, the Midwest or the Upper East or whatever, but uh, it's cold enough to, you know, it's not like you're out running around in yeah. fucking shorts, but the summers are brutal and there's yeah, like, I know I rode the last three <coughs> years have been riding my Harley across the country oh, for, no shit. for charity and, uh, I do it in July. Yeah. And everyone asked me, why, why the fuck do you ride in July through yeah. Texas and Louisiana? Because it sucks. I said, I said, it's, it's become a metaphor because I didn't pick the month. The month yeah. picked me. I, it, like many things we do in the nonprofit and veteran space, born out of tragedy. My buddy Dave, who I went to high school with, committed suicide in Montana. And I, I rode that first year across. But man, I tell you, it, it was, it's a very unifying event. It, yeah. it turned into this Forrest Gump like thing. And Texas being the biggest state we ride through, we hit four, five cities, um, nine, nine days, nine cities total. And the heat is just oppressive. Yeah. And I'm in full leather, no windshield. And yeah. But despite all that, there's worse things. That's yeah. the metaphor is riding your Harley across the country in July and enduring the heat. There's people out there that are struggling with a lot more and yeah. we're bringing them together. And that, that one event is just yeah. one of the things we do. I definitely want to get into that. I guess uh, we both got sidetracked. Uh, the morning routine when you uh, when you know. Yeah, the work. morning routine. Um, now we got snow up in Big Bear Lake, California, so the morning routine is slowed a little bit because of yeah. the weather. But um, I, I'm I'm disciplined to get up, work through the day. I normally don't like to check anything electronic in the morning. I like to read get reading done out of the way and I've been pretty good too about not reading a bunch of nonfiction stuff I've been trying to push myself into other areas to expand but I grew up Mike as a horrible student and I didn't read I yeah. didn't get read to I didn't read myself so I was a hor horrible student um, but I like to read in the morning um, I like to then kind of dig into clearing out my inbox, taking care of business, stuff that's going to make me money and that 
keeps the lights on. And then I, I like to do something physical. Normally it's going for a hike or anything. I don't necessarily feel like I have to be one of those guys that goes to a gym and does all that. Um, and then just really kind of subscribe to, you know, the rule of fours is every day. And I don't do this every day and I don't beat myself up over it. You, you can appreciate this. I, I like to spend an hour of my day reading or educating myself. It doesn't have to be some book that's, an, you know, eight inches thick. Yeah. It could be something that's educational, that makes me think critically. I, I like to do that for an hour a day. I like to put myself in an uncomfortable position an hour a day, at least an hour a day. And by that, it could be something physical. Oh. It could be uh, it could be standing in front of a, a group of high school kids giving a speech yeah. and, and talking to them. That's pretty uncomfortable for a 50-year-old guy yeah. uh, to turn the dial back and, and see all those blank faces out there. Yeah. I like to do something physical for an hour a day, whether it's walking or whether it's chopping wood, something, yeah. just to keep moving. And then one hour of the day I like to dedicate to – helping someone else uh, and that could be doing an email introduction it could be working for save the brave doing real work um, fundraising uh, events speaking some, something that helps someone else and I think that you know that's four hours of my day and the other 20 hours I can kind of screw off with or do whatever else I want yeah. but I think if you kind of subscribe to something like that as a discipline for yourself it's a pretty good start point yeah it kind of keeps me going because you know is in the military we have a regiment that's yeah. forced on us. And when you lose that regiment, a lot of guys have a hard time yeah. uh, maintaining some sort of routine. And a lot of people like to talk about self-discipline. I, I don't believe in self-discipline. It's just, it's just discipline. Yeah. Like you have a routine and, and that's a great question though, because yeah. I mean, I, that's, <clears throat> I'd say if there's one question that I ask every single guest I've ever had, it's that because I, you know, to me it tells two things. One Pretty much every guest I have on here is somebody that has their shit together and, and uh, you know, by, by societal standards is successful, you know. And so um, when you look at how everybody starts the, the, you know, the first few hours of their day, and, and most times it bleeds over into the, they tell me about the rest of their day too, but, um, you know, you, you can pick up a lot of, uh, you know, good um, you know, tidbits or, or things that I pull from people that say, you know, I do this and it works well, or I tried this and it was terrible or, or what, what have you, you know, it's just, it's a good, good lesson in, uh, in kind of what you're talking about and in, in routine and discipline. And I agree. I mean, I think one of, one of transitioning veterans, you know, when they go from the military to, to not being in the military, that's where it's kind of the, the, the X or the, the most dangerous point in their life because they, they don't have that handheld, force direction um you know and some of them if they if they don't put that same amount of of time effort mental bandwidth into something that's productive or at a minimum uh, gives them a feeling of fulfillment then that's when they turn to other things that uh, that it usually goes haywire and so I, yeah i mean i i couldn't agree more on on having uh, at least some structure to your day and, and that you stick to it no matter what but uh, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Um, so are you originally from California? Nope. I was born in suburb of Chicago, Waukegan, Illinois. And what, what was, uh, what was that like growing up there in terms of siblings and, and, uh, and you know, the, the time frame that you were born in and what it was like? Well, I come from broken home, like many people in the <clears throat> military. Uh, my parents divorced at a real early age. My mom raised me and my brother. Uh, and so I grew up with 
without a lot of supervision. I was kind of left to my own devices. I got in a lot of trouble. And then my brother and I, he's three years older than me. We used to fight physically, cats and dogs, and just destroy each other. And it just got to be a little bit much for me. So I decided to move back to Waukegan because uh, I was living in Springfield, Illinois with my mom. Moved back to Waukegan, Illinois, and went to high school. My whole high school career with my my dad, and my my stepmom, and same thing. Uh, not a lot of supervision, and I was a horrible student, as I alluded to. I barely squeaked out of high school with a stellar one point two four GPA. So anybody watching this pod, or listening, <laughs> I didn't know you like, could graduate. Exactly, <laughs> I'm still waiting to see a viewer or a friend or anyone beat that. Yeah. No, I don't know how I got out. No, I mean, mine was bad. It was. I think I was a two four. I think when I graduated, <laughs> but I didn't know you could graduate with a one two four. Well, I didn't. Yeah, okay. I, I failed gym yeah. <clears throat> uh, because I skipped so much school and I had yeah. to go to summer school. Yeah. So like I had to make up the credit. But the point of the story is, you know, I was I was bad. You know, I fought. I drank underage. My You're first car sports? was. A, What's that? Oh, go ahead. Your first car was what? My first car was a motorcycle. Oh, yeah. Nice. So I used to race it, and <clears throat> I ran from the cops, got caught by the cops, got thrown in jail. And was it a sport bike? or a Yeah, like... sport bike. Yeah. Uh, first one was a FJ600. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was pretty tight. Yeah. I found it from this <laughs> car salesman at uh, Sorensen Chevrolet when I was detailing cars, working yeah, after school and stuff. And uh, that, that was my intro, and I was, I think, just – Barely turned 16 and got my license, but that was my yeah. first car. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, so, yeah, you know, gr growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of supervision. But then one day the phone rings. It's, it's my buddy, Andy White, who's Dave's brother, the, the Navy vet I was telling you about, uh, committed suicide. And he says, hey, man, you'll never guess what I did. I said, well, what? He said, I joined the Marines. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the Marines. I knew a little bit about the military from from my, my dad. He was in the Army. And he says, you got to come meet these guys. And so you can imagine when you go into the recruiter's office, it's like this. It's cami nets and medals, and they're wearing their uniforms. And for a kid that had grown up Telling leading a very high-risk lifestyle, you meet these recruiters, uh, and they talk so much game. I thought, man, I have never met a bigger group of risk-takers yeah. The Marines. Yeah. So I enlisted. Right then and there. Yeah, right there. And uh, did you play any sports growing up? I did. I, I was active. I, I swam, played football, and yeah, uh, yeah always always physical involved yeah. in group sports. <clears throat> yeah. So you, uh, there, there wasn't really a light switch moment of something that inspired you to serve. It was just your buddy saying, hey, come check these fucking dudes out. It it was, and... I'm, great. I'm grateful for it. And, and you know why I share, I share the high school story, not because I was a, a bad student, but I think uh, I share that because after I joined the, the Marines and was enlisted and went to Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I hung up my rifle and, and was still in the reserve. I, I joined a reserve unit while I was in college for three years as a machine gunner and, and graduated from Illinois State with a much more respectable GPA. Yeah. But I worked my way through college, the GI Bill only paid 300 and some bucks back then because yeah. that's the testimony to what the military does for young people who yeah. come from broken homes or, you know, abusive upbringings uh, who just really want to find some sort of their own tribe. Yeah. And, you know, when you're kind of, you know, maybe there's a, it's funny you say about the light switch. And I think there are people in the military, especially or in law enforcement uh, or medical professionals, maybe even fall into this category where it's not necessarily a light switch moment. But I, I honestly believe that whether it's through nature or nurture, there's a, a segment of our society that are born into being protectors, mm -hmm. people that want to take care of people other than themselves. And I think that that is despite what all the Marine Corps and Navy SEAL bumper stickers say, that's really what we do is yeah. help people that can't help themselves. And I, I'm working on, on a second book and I was doing some interviews with this uh, pilot and he was telling me about his upbringing. I was, I'm sitting in your seat and I'm interviewing this guy. And what was funny was I was going through and he was interviewing and I said, well, yeah, growing up, did you, did you always want to be an attack helicopter pilot? He says, no, man, I, I want to be a veterinarian. Yeah. And even that resonated with me. It's like, well, you wanted to help someone other than yourself. And, and that was his goal. So I think that uh, 
my, my story is much like a lot of people that joined the military. Yeah. It, to me, there, there's a second part of that, at least for the military. I get the, the wanting to help people component. <clears throat> um, but I do think that there's a genetic anomaly um, that exists in, you know, high level first responders, you know, law enforcement, military that, um, that go into harm's way voluntarily. Um, you know, that, that's really a genetic flaw. Uh, if, if you think about it from like a, an evolutionary biology standpoint is that, you know, that, that trait, which very few people possess, I mean, it's, it's probably a, a percentage or a fraction of a percentage of people who basically have very little regard for their own safety, you know, or they, they lack a self-preservation gene. Um, but again, evolutionarily, like that doesn't lend itself to the survivability of a species, you know, or, or we wouldn't be a species. So <clears throat> to me, it kind of only stands to reason that very few people have that. But most people that have that, you know, it's, it's generally in conjunction with, um, you know, a, a desire to want to help people and protect and whatever, and it's kind of packaged together, and those people tend to, to find themselves in those those prof, uh, professions, which is odd. But because, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think, you know, or, or look at, <clears throat> you know, the, the warrior spirit, um, you know, for lack of better terms, um, as like those are the people that should be having kids and whatever, but there's there's a weird kind of dichotomy to that, I think. That there is. That, um, you know, if, if most people or if everybody had had that to them, then we'd be in trouble as a, as a species, you know. So it's kind of interesting. But um, not to get off on a tangent, but uh, so, all right. So you went to, um, to boot camp, uh, enlisted uh, for the first four years, and you were in Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was that experience like? Well, being able to serve is, is cool. Um, and I actually wrote about it. it the way I described it in, in Echo Ramadi was compared to the other deployments that I experienced throughout my career, <clears throat> Desert Shield and Desert Storm was almost an, un, you know, like a forgettable experience. It, it, there were memorable moments in it, but the war was over so quickly. Yeah. And there wasn't a whole lot of close in fighting. Uh, the air campaign really did much to destroy any threat that we had. But it was it, it was also interesting too when I look back on that because the culture of war had changed since Vietnam that, that we'd seen, and that was just a small drop in the bucket compared to what we'd experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last twenty plus years of fighting, having just ended the war uh, in Afghanistan. So when I look back at the importance of Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I, I don't say that to diminish what everybody did fighting during that time and, and the soldiers and Marines we lost during that war because it, it mattered most certainly. But again, comparatively uh, to what I'd experienced on other deployments, other combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was pale in comparison. Yeah. Just, I, I explained to the layperson that has never served what it was like fighting in Ramadi in 06, 07 as a Marine commander uh, in the infantry was most closely related to being Tom Brady as the quarterback of a Super Bowl team playing in the Super Bowl. And if you train every single day, every month for years and years, and there was never a game to play, you'd feel pretty useless as a, yeah. a member of a team. But for the Marines in Ramadi in 06, 07, it was, it was game on. Yeah. It was not a matter of if we get into a firefight, but when and how often. We were fighting five, six, seven times a day in direct contact with a very well-trained insurgent force. And, you know, if you had to have a metric of success, mine, mine was always steadfastly just bringing the boys home alive. That's yeah. my metric. But if you want to measure it in killing bad guys... Trust me, we were lighting up the scoreboard. Yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to get into that. Yeah. I, you know, when I uh, experienced watching um, the Gulf War, I was in junior high. Not to make you feel old, because fuck, I feel old at right, this point with that ha half the guests I have on. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's interesting, and I've, I've shared this before. But I remember watching it, and and I was actually. I was almost terrified. You know, like holy fuck, we're going to war. Like, what if I have to? I have, you know, like. You know, I was, I was worried that I was going to end up 
having to be there as a seventh grader. Uh, fast forward three, just three or four years later, and now like I wanted nothing more than to be part of it. You know, it's it's a weird, weird transition in in such a short amount of time. But um, but for me, you know, again, like being at that age and witnessing it, it's it's really fascinating to get to you know ask you a guy like you that was there what what it was like um you know in, in terms of whether it was the carnage of the air campaign or, or just kind of the overall feel i know comparing it to to ramadi and in, in iraq and afghanistan it's it's almost uncomparable that way but um you know what what kind of stands out as being the most memorable uh, from your time there we had a scud missile impact pretty close to our tent camp and it's a big, it's a big missile. Yeah. When you're on the receiving <clears throat> end of that thing, and I have a picture of it somewhere. I actually have some of the Scud missile casing that the shrapnel that had littered the camp and went through the Chow tents. There was no, for modern vets, there was yeah. no DFAC yeah. or Kellogg Brown and Root feeding you. It was a Marine yeah. who went to food prep school and probably just learned how to wash his hands and mix. Yeah. and heat tray rats and, <laughs> and served them up in a in a green canvas tent but that scud missile rocked the world and yeah. and bounced everyone out of their beds and to actually see it it, it really brought it home that yeah this is serious business yeah. and um i remember again being a lance corporal 19 years old just joined the marine corps and I, i'd only been in the marines for just over a year or some change and that night, when you were in middle school, I was sitting on post behind a 50 caliber machine gun when the air war launched from Sheikh Giza Air Base in Bahrain. And I watched almost every single plane, probably more than 200, scream over our position. Yeah. And all I could think about as a young 19-year-old kid was, man, it's going to be really bad for whoever is receiving yeah. the delivery yeah. of all that ordnance coming off those planes. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, I, I think it'll, it'll probably historically um rank as as probably the most lopsided and devasta devastating um war that that's taken place really i mean like the the precision and, and overwhelming firepower that took place there was uh i mean it was baffling um but so short-lived obviously were there any um engagements that you had with any enemy fighters like your your company or was it no, it was it, again the the ground war was only three days, yeah. and it was it was it was kind of in and out. I think everybody did their part, <clears throat> and yeah, it's interesting. You, we're even talking about it. a lot of the people don't ask me about that. They want to get right into like kicking doors in a Ramadi and killing bad guys. But when I think about it, and even the work we do in the nonprofit sector, we do a lot of handouts and hand ups for Vietnam vets. We don't forget about those guys and. You know, there's always something about World War II vets on mainstream media. And, you know, we just lost Herschel Woody Williams, you know, a dear friend of mine. And uh, that guy was still kicking gravity in the teeth at age 98. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we don't think about Desert Storm vets. I think yeah. even guys like me that fought and then continued to serve and went in, I, th I think it's, you, you, there's a, there, we naturally do this as Marines. We compare stuff all the time. But I don't think we we give those men and women enough credit. Yeah, I agree. Honestly. I mean, it's uh, I mean, I've I've known a number of people that were part of it, and and it had its, uh, you know, failures and successes like anything. And yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we were talking we were talking about this uh, with Todd earlier, and um, you know, we're we're never going to enjoy as veterans uh, from the wars we fought in Iraq and Afghanistan what the greatest generation and they they did snag a pretty cool generational name yeah. the greatest generation it's hard to beat gen x doesn't have the same way yeah. we're never going to have a, a 75th reunion in belgium for the battle of the bulge yeah. and be received by the people of that town in bastogne yeah to say thank you i mean i went back there with another marine a couple years ago when he he wrote an amazing book called the rifle which is all world two stories andy biggio and there are grandchildren, great grandchildren, dressed in GI uniforms as these seventy fifth anniversary um, honorees were there, and they're I think the youngest. We brought fifteen of them back with us. There was uh, a ninety two year old was the youngest, and I think the oldest was one hundred and two. Yeah, 
and they crushed it every day, but we'll never enjoy that. And it's funny to think about sitting in my recliner watching Fox News as an 80-year-old and hearing a story about the last Desert Storm veteran has died. I do. We, yeah. Are we going to get that? I probably don't, not. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I don't think we're going to. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Not yeah. that that's the goal. Yeah. I, you know, we don't serve and look for accolades like yeah. that. But yeah, it, no, it's, it, it's interesting when you talk about how our American culture accepts what our warrior tribe does and yeah. how they respond to that because yeah yeah the world war ii guys are are fading away very fast the yeah. vietnam guys and then you know we, we're still not giving korean war vets the credit yeah. they deserve i mean that's another yeah i mean it's ap- aptly the named the, the forgotten war i mean it, you know it, and it is it's like you, you hardly ever hear any mention of it and it was uh every bit as brutal as as any of them you know yeah, uh, absolutely pretty wild but um, all right, so you came back from Desert Storm and then um, went to college. Uh, what did you get your degree in? Criminal justice. Nice. Yes. Um, no math involved. Yeah. Wanted to, did, you, did you have a desire to go like FBI route? Is that, was that part of why you picked it? Or I did, actually. Uh, I, I was a little older than the average bear when I went to college, yeah. which was an advantage, I think, because it made me very disciplined. And I always, I share that earlier, I graduated in three years uh, because I went to night school and day school and summer school. It was a mission for me. Yeah. And I credit that to the discipline I got in the Marines. So I was planning on working for the U S federal marshal service and there was some delay or a hiring freeze going on. And I just thought to myself, I cannot bartend and wait tables for another year until things open up. And like, anything that happens in the military, the non-commissioned officer is behind it. Yeah. This kid named Sergeant Connor calls me up. I had submitted a package <clears throat> to go to officer candidate school for this two summer package. And it just seemed like it was three boot camps instead of going to two, if I want to be an officer, but he called me up and he says, Hey, sir, uh, I got your package out again. I was wondering if you're still interested. I can get you a boat space in January to go to officer candidate school in Quantico, Virginia. And, he signed me up to run a fitness test and a physical. And the next thing you know, I was getting commissioned. Um, wow. I, I, I'd like to dig out my paperwork and find yeah. that guy's first name and yeah. social media stock. I mean, just say thanks. Yeah. And because, uh, again, you, you never know the impact you're going to make. Like, had it not been for that guy. Yeah. And that's how, how important it was. I remember his name. I don't remember his first name, but yeah, it's going to be a mission. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so what what was your path like after that? Did you go right back to an operational unit? I went from OCS to basic school, infantry officers course, and that's a year of your life as a as a Marine officer that you spend in Quantico becoming a basic rifleman and a lot of the other classmates you train with are not prior enlisted. There's yeah. maybe 15 or 20 percent that have, have served in some branch or another but i went from my training pipeline after that year straight to 29 palms california as an infantry officer and in command as a second lieutenant of almost 50 young warriors and then <clears throat> it goes back and forth between you know operational tours schools um your b billet I, w- I was lucky in my b billet i wasn't at the pentagon or in recruiting duty i was always operational i was in command of an anti-terrorism unit um which was great because you're a captain you got another captain who's helping you and you're doing anti-terrorism operations in the med and in, in the pacific rim all, all around the world you're you're conditioned one all the time we're training with the nsw guys as trailer platoon, you know, doing maritime interdiction ops. And it was pretty cool. Yeah. And af- after that tour, I, I went back to school as a captain and was selected as commander uh, for another Victor unit, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, where I commanded Echo Company. And the war was uh, was ongoing. I'd, I'd already been to uh, Baghdad as on, on a 10-month deployment with FAST Company, the anti-terrorism unit. And then school and then i got graduated early so i could take command of echo 24 and that's where the story picks up and was again you know i look back at that point i'd i'd been in the marines for around 15 years and had you know several deployments and combat tours but uh, honestly 
it was the, the pinnacle of my career. Yeah. And, and, I, and I liken it back to being, you know, in the Super Bowl yeah. because that's, no one thinks that they're going to want to be in that situation, but uh, that that's where you're tested. All right. So as you know, uh, Mudwater's been a staunch supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now. Um, and they're now running a Veterans Day uh, promotion where they're going to be donating 10% of uh, the customer revenue to uh, Heroic Hearts Project, which is an organization that directly helps veterans uh, process their military trauma and PTSD by providing access to psychedelic treatment, which, um, you know, over the last few years, we've had a number of guests on the show that, uh, you know, have really, um, you know, kind of testified to the fact that that their lives have been changed by a lot of this treatment. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very appreciative of Mudwater for this new campaign that they're doing really spearheading the uh, the giving back to the kind of the uh, psychological side of uh, of trauma that a lot of combat veterans deal with. Uh, they've got a Rise Blend, <clears throat> which is a coffee alternative, and it's got four adaptogenic mushrooms in it, um, as well as some some herbs with a fraction of caffeine. Uh, it's it's a, a fraction of a cup of coffee's worth of caffeine. So you, you get the same uh, energy and, and lack of tiredness um, from a cup of coffee without the, the crash at the end. Uh, each ingredient was added for a specific purpose. You've got cacao and chai for mood and a micro, that microdose of caffeine. Uh, you've got lion's mane mushrooms for alertness. You've got cordyceps to help support uh, physical performance. Chaga and raishi to support the immune system. Uh, turmeric for soreness. And then cinnamon for the antioxidants. Uh, for me... Uh, my jam with that is uh, stevia vanilla drops and a splash of heavy cream. Uh, that's how I like to, to drink it, and that's how I used to drink coffee and, and now how I've replaced it with mud water. Um, it's fantastic stuff. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. It, it's not hard on, on your stomach the way coffee is, um, but it, it gives you that same ritual and, and kind of, uh, you know, almost nostalgic morning cup of joe that uh, that everybody tends to, to dig. So, uh, if you go to Mudwater, that's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash Mike, you will get 15% off. Um, and again, I, I want to encourage you guys, you know, by supporting the sponsors, that's the best way to support the Mike Drop podcast and, and give us the ability to bring you these guests show after show and, and uh, get everybody's story out. So again, that's Mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash Mike, uh, and use that code Mike for 15% off. Uh any of the prior combat deployments that you went on before you were in uh, in Ramadi, were there any operations that, that stood out as being like, holy shit, these are pretty legit, or were they all kind of afterthoughts at this point by comparison? No, the, I, I think throughout my career and the, the history of our modern-day military has been punctuated with a lot of conflicts from – Somalia, Panama, uh, Grenada, <clears throat> all of these micro wars that we've conducted and some of the major ones, even Desert Storm was a, was a major operational uh, campaign. It was a war. Everyone plays a part in how the world stage is set up. And for those who serve on active duty now, all of that resident expertise of the guys who were doing the fighting throughout this generation, our generation, is fading away fast. It's really almost absent because I still stay very connected to active duty units. And when I go on bases and I, I see them in their uniforms, or I'll even ask the question, anybody here been to combat? No hands. I said, that's not uh, anything attributional on you. I'm just asking to gauge because it's interesting that the importance of writing about military history, the importance of storytelling and sharing that, whether it's on podcasts or in an article, or in a, in a newspaper, blog, or whatever, sharing those lessons, I think, is vital. Yeah. And, and I say that not be for my own personal gratification. It's <clears throat> for this generation that is manning the rails of these ships now. Yeah. And right. I tell you what, I sleep pretty well at night. I don't know about you, knowing that the young men and women that I trained in my 24 years under the leadership now with the gear, equipment, technology, and what I gave them and left behind, I feel pretty confident in this generation that is doing that. And I say it often about no one ever really accuses me of being a generationalist because I love the younger generation. I, I love millennials. I love Gen Z. All, all, and those are the people that are fighting for us right now. 
Those yeah. are the cops that are going to come to your house or stitch you up if you go to the emergency room. Yeah. Millennial. Yeah. No, I, so I agree. I, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly uh, happy with some of the, or a lot of the upper echelon military leadership right now. Uh, I think the, you know, the caliber of people volunteering, there, there's still a, a high level caliber there, but uh, the joint chiefs and secretary of the everything, uh, military DOD wise, I, I, I'm not, not fans of any of their, uh, theirs, but, um, going back to the, any of the, the combat operations prior to being in Ramadi, uh, do any stand out as being significant that, um, that you re- can recall and, and share that story? Well, being in, being in Baghdad with the anti-terrorism unit was, that was an interesting time. Cause that was Oh four on that deployment. And, our, our mission is just just to be clear is we're anti-terrorism not counter-terrorism so we're all about setting the conditions whether they're active or passive measures so that people don't get in and hurt the force we do a lot of diplomatic and, and vip security convoy operations basically safeguarding pretty high level individuals and at the time we were living in the bowels of saddam's palace in baghdad and it was gorgeous. I, I don't know if you were ever there or not, but um, not at that one. We uh, we took down his palace in Tikrit. Uh, my platoon did. But were, were you there in 04 as well? Not in 04. Okay, but the the, the you, you get the how ornamental the palaces oh, are yeah. and like everything's you know yeah it's crazy. covered in gold and then you look at the chandeliers and they're made of plastic and like they just don't get it. But we lived in the in the bowels of the basement with the. Diplomatic security service for State Department, and we lived down there. And sometimes the sewers would overflow, and they'd come up through. It just it was horrible living conditions. But we were out in the heat doing a lot of motorcade uh, convoy ops, and we also worked with private military contractors as well. At then they were called Blackwater, but everybody and their brother, Triple Canopy, Aegis, everybody was over there trying to get a piece of the action, and and. We were looking at these guys like they were making so much money yeah, and they were doing less work than we were actually doing at, at the time. But that whole PMC world, you, it, you know, guys love that. They naturally gravitate uh, from the military into the PMC world because, one, the money's great. Yeah. They're great at their jobs. It's what they're great at doing um, for their vocation. And yeah. they're applying the, all the all the training back into the PMC world. But And they have half the year off. Yeah, they have half the year off. Yeah. Or they're blowing all the thousands yeah. they made down in <laughs> North Africa on vacation yeah. or someplace. Fucking but Thailand. it was really – the conduct of the operations, to answer the question, was of significant importance because – the palace itself was the embassy and, until we built the embassy in Baghdad. And there was so much fighting going on. It was boiling over in 04 that they were about to evacuate that palace. And it wasn't until one of the Marine anti-terrorism units went over to do a site assessment. It was a senior level official that just looked at one of the Marines and said, who are you guys? Yeah. So, oh, if you want us, you got to talk to the secretary of the Navy because that's who owns us. We work for the Navy and it was a, a mission that just kind of boiled over. And as, as we became more successful, more platoons and more platoons would, were being deployed to Baghdad to set the conditions. So there was security for all those interagency people to conduct daily business. And if you'd ever been into one of those palaces, you know, it was as if you walked into a Star Wars cantina during that yeah. scene where you've got all these strange <laughs> creatures from business suits and ties to tactical casual to full on dress military yeah. uniform you know women uh, there were kids that were in and out of that place they were doing visas and passports all kind it was like cats sleeping with dogs in there literally and uh, it was a long 10 month deployment but again in comparison to other deployments we got shot at and there were a lot of rocket attacks but uh, and IEDs were a big threat we didn't have vehicles that we had no 607 we were driving down the highways hoping not to get shot and then someone thought it was a genius idea to make steel doors for the humvees but it was 130 degrees and you couldn't rest your arms on the doors or yeah. they'd burn yeah and we're creating makeshift ways to you know stay protected from ieds and the tactics change 
so quickly in that environment, you, you understand this uh, intimately, is you leave a theater in 04 and you come back in 06, it's changed that yeah. fast. Yeah. So you don't drive fast anymore, you drive slow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's lightning it fast and it's, uh, yeah, some things that you did uh, a year before are now, you know, uh, going to get you killed in a, in a heartbeat. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, so uh, I guess one, one question uh, before we get into the Echo uh, and Ramadi stuff. Uh, where were you at uh, when 9-11 happened? Okinawa. Okay. How, how did that impact your unit? Uh, I was a first lieutenant on that deployment. I don't know why I was up that late. I saw it hit. I'm watching. I see the second one hit, and I go make a phone call. It says terrorist attack. Instinctively, we knew this. And then I ran down the second deck of the barracks, woke up all the lieutenants, and we're all glued to the TV. Um, it, it was shocking. Yeah. And then as the other events unfolded in, in <clears throat> Pennsylvania and in the Pentagon, uh, it was a feeling of helplessness, which quickly turned into a feeling of absurdity as commanders and senior level leaders were ordering the Marines and soldiers on this tiny little Japanese island in the Pacific to man automatic weapons on the perimeters of these bases, which are guarded by Japanese and Marines for yeah. the most cases. So it spun out of control pretty fast. And um, you were talking about this, um, and I use a Super Bowl analogy, and I remember that you wanted to do more. You wanted to get in the fight. We didn't know who we were fighting, though, at that, at that point on 9-11. The deployment ended. Uh, I did several other deployments, and... I can remember watching the news from Virginia when they caught Saddam Hussein. And most people, I'm sure the majority of Americans and even around the world, were elated. Said, oh, man, they caught Saddam Hussein. The war is going to be over. I'm thinking I'm not going to get an unemployment in. Yeah. I'm not going to go back and fight and do what I'm trying to do. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Because I see his scraggly ass getting pulled from that spider hole. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a great example of be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Yeah. And, you know, a year later I was back in command and, and engaged in some of the you know, bloodiest fighting in modern urban warfare. Yeah. So speaking of which, um, walk us through the, that experience from, you know, kind of the initial kickoff of when you were put in charge of that group and you knew that that's where you, you were going – um, what was your mentality like knowing kind of what the fighting was like there and, and what you were going to be going into? How did you kind of both mentally re prepare yourself as well as the men that you were in charge of uh, to go do that? Non-commissioned officers. I relied on them heavily. Uh, I, I've always, I, I won't say I've always known this. I, this took me a long time to learn, Mike, was be a better listener. And I trust me, the, the <laughs> irony is not lost on me as a guy that is sitting here on a podcast one or it writes and travels around the world and talks, but that, that's something totally different than being a great leader and, and listening to those you're responsible for. You're responsible to them moreover. <clears throat> so when I got orders, when they said, Hey, you're not going to walk across the stage and get your diploma at the captain's course in Quantico, you're going to take command, which we didn't, we loved it. Drove across country, trailered my Jeep out, parked it in the parking lot, Camp Pendleton, California, on a Wednesday. I took command on a Friday. That next week, we were in 29 Palms in the high desert, Camp Wilson, in old aluminum Quonset huts, sweating it out. And one of the first things I did was I got all of my non-commissioned officers, sergeants, staff sergeants, corporals, even some lance corporals that fought in Ramadi in 2004. And I got all those all those warriors together and we talked and I wanted to hear their concerns. Most importantly, I, I want to hear their concerns on how it applied to the training we were receiving for the next 30 days in the high desert. And for the most part, 
almost unanimously, all of those sergeants and corporals were in agreement that this, this is good training. So they also did this phenomenal thing that I was, I, I still am in awe of it today because y you've experienced this people experience this in life. Some, some sort of heavy handedness or whatever you want to call it hazing or bullying, or I know it alls. There was none of that. These guys that were Lance corporals, young 18, 19 year old kids fighting in 2004 in Ramadi, they took all of that and it was almost their personal mission to make sure that the young Marines that just joined the unit didn't suffer the same things they did. It was such a, such a brotherly mindset that these guys had. I, I, I still to this day, I think that takes a lot of maturity. Yeah. And that's what war does to these guys. It, it matures you pretty fast. Yeah. And well, I think, I think the, you know, hazing is a, <clears throat> is a very useful tool. Um, but I, you know, and I think that there's benefit even of, of having like the welcome to the club, initial kind of initiation hazing uh, that, that makes sense. But, you know, ha having been in the SEAL teams, you know, for several years prior to 9-11 and then for a number of them afterwards, um, there was a huge difference that, that same way. I think a, a lot of the just like, I'm going to haze you just to be a dick because I'm, I'm fucking bored, honestly. I, I think a lot of it stems from, from that, from boredom, is that, it's like there's not a war going on. We're a bunch of warriors, so we're just going to beat the shit out of one another for, uh, you know, for fun. But, yeah. uh, you know, so it, it I, w we definitely saw that too where, you know, hazing still existed, but it was it was more of a remediational tool. It, I, I think that uh, we, we've all, every service branch has unfortunately had to see where, you know, the, the gross definition of hazing is when we – at least growing up through my career, there, there was never this maliciousness to it. And there's been units and there's been individuals that have crossed that line and just taken it way too far. But I think when we think about hazing is we, we assimilate tradition. Yeah. And we, it, it's kind of good humored, um, fun, you know, laced with a little, uh, adolescent jocularity and some physical stunts. But, uh, I think there's, you know, problems when that's grown out of control where it's been degrading to people yeah. and and that happens and i don't condone it whatsoever uh, but i think that there's you're right there's a lot of utility into and the Marine, marines love tradition yeah. uh, we're, we're steeped in it and when we start losing you know little pieces of of, of good tradition i i think that that's a problem for any any service branch yeah, yeah absolutely yeah um all right so the guys are the the kind of old not old the uh, experienced guys are, are bringing the young guys under their wing and and you're getting ready uh, and then you get you get over there what was it like uh from the instant boots on the ground was it just balls to the wall the second you you got off the plane well to set the stage uh what had been happening in in Western Alambar province outside of Baghdad and Ramadi and Fallujah, the war had been boiling over. And I, I use a analogy of a giant game of whack-a-mole where these insurgent forces were popping up in cities like Fallujah, like Baghdad, and we would hammer them down, just crush them either through force on force, air superiority, and we'd crush them into fine powder and they'd go to ground and then they'd seep away. And then they'd find a spot of least resistance to pop back up. And they'd pop back up in a Ramadi or a Al Kut or Tikrit. But we didn't have that leverage to really apply that pressure. So when President Bush <clears throat> ordered the surge strategy in 06 and 07, flooding the battlefield with an additional 20 or 30,000 troops, that really allowed us to apply that pressure to all of those areas. And that's what we did. Sadly, it took a lot of resources. Um, that were a portion allocated for the for the Afghanistan war away, and you know our brothers and sisters suffered a little bit over that. But it allowed us to apply that pressure. It just so happened that in 06 and 07, Ramadi is where everybody wanted to fight. That's where they made a stand, and that's where um, we were thrust in. And as we were 
onboard amphibious shipping on the USS Boxer floating over on November 10th, uh, 2006, our commander from the MEU came out and announced on the Marine Corps birthday that we're going to war. And once we transited over and we started flying in, we were part of a Army uh, Brigade Combat Team. That's who my company was uh, assigned to. And I, I fought under the command of the Army independently. And I wrote about all of that in the book and because it was such a, a great relationship. And the Army, they love Marines. And when we rolled into town, um, and we didn't roll, we flew. I was a helicopter company commander. We flew uh, into Iraq, pre-staged, got everybody geared up, kitted up. And then the Army picks us up in Chinooks, and they fly us into Camp Corregidor in the middle of the night. And you can see the gunfire as you're coming in. You can see tracer rounds just splayed all across the cityscape. And we knew it was game on. We'd already heard, and we'd done plenty of our own intelligence gathering beforehand and, and pushed all that information down, maps, intelligence assessments, routes, uh, Kazavak, how we're going to take care of people if they got hurt. All of those things were done before we landed. But when we landed, we knew this was about to get busy. Yeah. And uh, did you guys have kind of a turnover contingent that uh, you were replacing guys and you did some <laughs> joint ops, or, or were you getting getting after it right out of the get-go? We had, we had, a, sh we had a short turnover period uh, with 1-9 Infantry, which was Manchu, and Chuck Ferry was the commander. When we got into town, I got my in-brief with the colonel, and he says, hey, this is your area. And their operations officer, Jared Norell, was, was a, this guy was a killer too. And I loved working with him. Huge map of Ramadi on the wall. And he says, we're going to give you this area. And he draws it on a grease pencil. And he says, can you handle this? You do this. I grabbed a pencil and said, we can, we can handle all this. I've got 258 Marines and sailors. He says, how many? Yeah, I don't think he really knew how many we had. Because in comparison to the Army that was fighting in zone, we look like rock stars, these guys. Yeah. They, they had been fighting for at least a year when we got there and had suffered such high attrition. I think the Army companies were anywhere from 80 to 100 soldiers. Yeah. So they really didn't have a lot. It was basically a drive through the city, don't stop here, shoot here, here's the location you can occupy. And then once we occupied our firm bases, which were nothing more than a hotel, a big house that some family lived in that got bombed out or we kicked them out and we took over and we used those three spots in that zone of the city to conduct our patrols out of and to do assessments and reconnaissance. And we did the majority of it at night because we owned the night. And just, just to put it in, comparison we're, we're we're talking about a city with three hundred thousand people in it so it it's i think a lot of people may have misunderstood how even in afghanistan as remote it was that's like fighting on the moon it's just remote but iraq was a very well developed mature uh, country yeah. and you know these people they didn't have anywhere to go so you're not only fighting people that are trying to kill you every single day and survive but you're also fighting amongst the people that have to survive. And you never knew who the enemy was either. That was, that was a really big challenge for us. Yeah. Was there a, a commander's intent, if you will, when you, like, as you got there, your boss, did he, I mean, I know you mentioned the grease pencil thing, but did anything accompany that as far as direction from him of saying, here's what I want you to do? Or is it just, Hey, go in there and kick, kick ass and, and take this over and, and make this area secure. Like, was there any higher level direction than that? The the orders were to kill or capture anti-Iraqi forces. That was our mission. Yeah. And in addition to that, we had rules of engagement, which said what we can do and what we cannot do. <clears throat> what was interesting about this deployment was the rules of engagement not only changed from a chronological standpoint, from time on how the war developed, but at the same time, the rules of engagement could be so permissive in one city like Ramadi and so restrictive in another city like Fallujah, where they'd already been kicking doors in and killing bad guys for, for months and years on end. 
those things change so fast. That was really a challenge as a commander for me, especially because uh, we not only fought in Ramadi during that deployment, which we got extended two or three times. I can't remember how many, but we pushed over to another city during that same deployment to clear it with uh, some other Marines and, and soldiers as well. But in Ramadi, the ROEs were very permissive. If they're driving, shoot them. Yeah. If they're digging, shoot them. If they're out at night, shoot them. It was, and everybody in the town knew that. They knew how we were operating. They knew what to do, what not to do, how to interact. But then you go to uh, another town like Rutba, and it changes. And I always try to liken it to taking a guy uh, who doesn't have a lot of military training, young 18, 19 year old kid. <clears throat> you give him some training, a couple months, physically fit, give him a machine gun and a box of ammo. I'm pretty confident that, you know, the Lance Corporal can go from zero to 60 and engage the enemy and kill with pretty high degree of success. But you take that same kid in that environment that we were fighting in Ramadi, and now we go across the other side of the country to get that same individual to go from 60 to zero. That's a real leadership challenge. Yeah. That's tough Yeah, because there's the mental preparation hasn't set in yet. And that's a tough thing. And that's where you have to protect not only your force, but the civilian population as a commander, because you're responsible for them. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that I think would lend itself to the success of being able to do that is one thing that I continue to be baffled by, which is, is a lack of, kind of the 30,000 foot view direction from commanders to uh, to the troops there. And, and I know we were in that same position. Granted, I was 23 at the time when I, you know, when I was in Iraq, but, um, but is that the lack, like there, there just seems to be a lack of, uh, of again, direction that exists there. And I think, um, you know, one, maybe it's, you know, as I get older and, and, you know, own several businesses and just my mentality shifts to, um, to, you know, just more of that, that way of thinking, I guess, uh, you know, maybe that's why I think about it more, but it just seems like even down to the lowest common denominator, the, the 19 year old private, like if he's, if he has an understanding of why we're there and, and what the big picture is to me, it, it would, it would only serve as a, a useful exercise in, in informing everybody and, and getting them to a level where they can be more successful, especially in, a, in an instance where you're trying to get them to go from 60 to zero, is that if they understand what, what that big picture is, I think it would be easier to do that because showing up and just being like, hey, here are the lines, don't color outside of them, you know, and, and fucking shoot, shoot and kill everybody inside of it. Other, you know, if, if they're doing this, this, and this, like, I don't know, it just seems like, you know, by, by keeping the the shock troops if you will so uninformed as to what the the big picture is i think it does a, a big disservice to the entire united states military i agree 100 percent. and I, there's an argument to be made too is how much information do that do you need to know at each level and in this day and age too and with a new horizon of warfare uh, in our face the, the the information management piece is is huge thing i'm not saying we want all these young soldiers and marines to be kept in the dark and even yeah. as a captain mike at my level as a commander i, I honestly think that I, I should have known more i should have known more but uh, honestly when, when you when you when you want to dissect these wars in, in iraq and afghanistan that took up two decades and billions and billions of dollars and and thousands and thousands of human lives there was never a clear definition of what winning is. And yeah. that's not the fault of one presidency or two administrations, but three. Yeah, Every single administration had a hand in that. And that's where the military, as a tool of failed diplomacy, uh, that's not our job. Yeah. That's what we count on our elected officials to decide for us. Yeah. Because guaranteed, those guys aren't going downrange kicking doors in and killing bad guys. What we count on them to do is their job. And that's to really give a clear definition of what winning is. And we didn't do that yeah. at the administrative level. So for any veterans listening to the show, believe me, every single man, woman, and dog that was on that battlefield at the tactical level, fighting, killing the bad guys and doing their job, they're winners. Yeah. Those guys absolutely won. And 
No one needed a letter from the Joint Chiefs of Staff to say, hey, thanks for your service, Afghan vets. Uh, we didn't need that. Yeah. We knew we did a great job. Yeah, It was your fault that we failed to have a plan yeah. for an effective withdrawal yeah. from that country. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, it mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bubb's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. I just wish that they would uh, reconcile that, you know, and, and say, yeah, we fucked that up. We let you guys down. You know, I mean, to me, I, I think that would, that would clear a lot of it up for a lot of disgruntled uh, veterans, myself included, that if there was some, some, level of fucking accountability at, at the higher levels and there just never is, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's disheartening. That's why I love Fred Galvin's book. If you yeah. had men and, and, you know, love being, love being part of that project because Fred had a lot of moral courage to, yeah. to yeah. highlight that. And I think when you're, you're talking about accountability is in everything we preach and, and brag about as members of the military, about all the leadership traits and principles, when they get to that certain political level as a general and flag officer, it seems to be lost. Yeah. It, it really does. And it doesn't really satiate me a whole lot when I hear other retired general officers slamming those guys who are still on active duty about not stepping to the plate or not taking uh, a knife in their career mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of the betterment of the troops. But it really lends itself to an important question is the for lack of a better term, the middle management, those field grade officers that are learning from those general officers example right now through the winding down of these wars, uh, how effective are they going to be? Are they going to repeat those same things? Yeah. Or are they going to read things of importance and understand that when we take on the responsibility of going into another country, another culture, moreover, and disrupting it, how are we going to take care of our people? How are we going to take care of the mission? My hope is that, uh, that they can think critically enough to where it's not just a, uh, this is how we've always done it and monkey see monkey do and, and do the same, same dumb broken shit. But, uh, I guess we'll, we'll see if that happens. 
Um, <clears throat> all right, so actions on. Do you remember the the first like legit? Holy fuck, that was a gunfight that you got into. In in Ramadi. In Ramadi. Well, they were shooting at us when we landed, but the I think the first assignment we had was. I think the guys took the sniper rifles out and, and zeroed them back there at Camp Corregidor. Which, when I say the word camp, anybody that's seen a camp, it's not like that. It was like a junkyard with dilapidated buildings from an agricultural university that got taken over and ransacked. We had probably been there two or three days. I don't even know of that. And there was a mission that came up that they had abducted... Um, one of the local officials, I think he was a, a tribal leader, and it shot him. They didn't know if he was killed. And they dragged him over to a, a school, an elementary school, and they needed a quick reaction force to go out. Our guys were already set up. So the op, OPSO, Major Norell, he says, Scott, do you got this? I said, we're on it, sir. Like first, you know, yeah. charging right out of the gates, Fucking excited. The Marines were all excited. The vehicles are ready to go the ammo's all shiny at, at this point and it was day we drove through the city we knew all the routes we had a plan briefed and we came around this turn which was in the central part of the city kind of a choke point and we had overwatch from apache aircraft the army sniper teams were up there and we located the target and just as we come around the corner it, they saw us coming a mile away and it probably was only a mile from camp corregidor to the target site but we got lit up and the the vehicles just started taking small small arms fire and it, you could hear just pinging off the side of the were you guys in doors. armored humvees we were in yeah, up armored humvees and we didn't have any armor support at the time we had armor support dedicated to us but they just didn't roll with us on this first mission but we just started getting sprayed down like it was cool and it was my turret gunner sergeant israel he goes i'm hit and he caught a ricochet across the bridge of his nose and it, it looked worse than it was but that was our first casualty i think someone else in one of the other vehicles got hit we had four or six trucks that were blazing down there and right when we started getting hit i knew that by the time even though we had a visual on the school there was no way that that body was still going to be there with all these insurgents floating around. So we had to evac and, and RTB and go back to Camp Corregidor and reassess. The biggest lesson learned, I think, was we don't go out in daytime. Yeah. We own the night, and we learned that lesson the hard way a couple times. And, but we, we learned from it, yeah. and we applied it. So. Uh, no, no serious casualties that ended up in guys uh, being evacuated out or... On that not mission. on that not on that mission but we we suffered um you know plenty of casualties guys that got hit and um you know we lost uh three marines from my company um during that deployment the the first was in my company which was was pretty tough that i i, I wrote about and, and being able to call his mom after we lost corporal libby on december 6th which is coming up on the anniversary of that and that was tough because he was the first one in the battalion. We, our whole battalion had been dismantled to support the surge strategy because we were kind of an added feature being a Marine Expeditionary Unit floating uh, across the world. And we, when we chopped into the Middle East, it was a really tough decision to pull the trigger and, and launch the Mew because that's the theater reserve, those 2,500 Marines and sailors that's it. That's the world's 911 force that's floating out there at any given time. And when they sent us in, they, they dismantled the Mew. And it, wherever the hottest resistance was, that's where we went. And it was me and John Smith from Fox Company that got assigned to go to Ramadi. And, um, yeah, it was um, – there's a, there a lot of guys that got hit. There's, yeah. And, you know, I, I always say this publicly – I never ever professed to say that my company and, and the Marines and, and soldiers that fought uh, alongside us experienced the worst fighting or the most loss or the most casualties. There, there's plenty of units and, and, and people out there that 
suffered more, endured more, lost more. Um, we were, we were just there to do our part, man. And I think that because of the leadership at every level, from from those young Lance Corporals who fought in 04 to the sergeants and even those brand new lieutenants, man, I, I would uh, I would not be sitting here today. It wasn't for those guys. Yeah. Love them. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of some of the, the early on engagements, obviously the first daytime one, uh, sounds like it was a, a humbling, good lesson learned. Um, what was the first night, uh, engagement where you went out and you feel like, yeah, we really fucking got some and, and handed, handed them their ass this time. Yeah, that was, I think, there were plenty of those nights I could, I could tell stories all day long, but, uh, in December 6th, when we lost Corporal Libby was a night that redefined what fighting was for me uh, and having been in combat before and, and my share of firefights, when that fight started across the city as a well coordinated complex attack, uh, we, we were engaged for five hours plus. And we were bringing everything to bear um, that we could. But that was a night. It had no religious significance or tactical significance. It was just a date that they picked. I I still haven't found the answer to this. But that night on December 6th, we had enemy insurgents in teams maneuvering against our positions all across the city. I mean, they had eyes on these guys through thermals and MVGs with U.S. military-style tactics, bounding and throwing frag grenades and launching RPGs to cover their movement. They knew what they were doing that night, and they were were determined to put up a hell of a fight. At the end of the day, they lost badly. Uh, We lost Corporal Libby that night. The Army got hit hard down south, and then we took, I think, four other casualties, um, and a couple other guys just got uh, some really bad concussions too because the tanks were pulled up so close to us in that city and it's pitch black and they're inside a tank with a big 120 millimeter gun. They weren't always looking around. It, it was just so congested. Vehicles and buildings and people and patrols and guys on rooftops going at it. And it was it was pretty chaotic to say the least there was a lot of friction that night can you walk us through like the before you went out what the kind of what the plan was and then and then there was no plan it was just we're going out tonight we were already established out in the city for a couple weeks and i was in the tactical operations center getting briefed by colonel ferry and the call had come across the radio that a marine had been hit and there were other Marine units in town. And then we found out it was Corporal Libby. And he was at uh, entry control point eight. It was a building that we owned in the middle of the city. <clears throat> they were trying to figure out the best way to Kazavac him out of there. They didn't know if he'd been killed yet. He, he got shot in the back of the neck. No helos flying in the city. We did not own the skies. It was too, too dangerous and too congested to try and land a helicopter to get him back to the combat aid station. And he says, Scotty, you got this? I said, I'm on it, sir. So I took my personal convoy. We drove through the city, uh, pitch black, tracers just screaming across the head of the Humvee. It was anything you'd ever seen in a Hollywood movie. But it was real life. And we couldn't afford a CAS bag. We couldn't wait. And I sat out there. Went to the roof. The boys were slinging lead. There's explosions. It was just as intense as you can get. It's deafening. And this is ongoing. And I made the decision on the spot to have the Marines take Corporal Libby and put him in my Humvee. And I drove him back to the combat outpost, to the um, surgical hospital there. And the Marines took him in. And my first sergeant, Tom Foster, he was standing there ready to get Corporal Libby to make sure he was taken care of. And I, I remember trying to get into the battalion aid station. Tom, he stops me. He's like, hey, sir, you know, we got this. He goes, you need to get back out there. He was right. 
as 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 much as I wanted to be in there with that kid who, you know, just took a round. I knew where my place was. I mean, I had another 250 guys counting on me. So we went back out into the city that night and it just, it just continued to go on and on. And there was so much, uh, fighting that we were going through ammunition so fast. I think the army had to figure out a new way to replenish all the Marine posts that were out there because we were just crushing it. And, they, I think they invented this thing called speedball, which was pre-staging pallets or small blocks of ammunition of all the calibers we had gone through the most, and they were pre-staging those. And then we'd just call on the radio, and they would just send that right out to us to a location. Sometimes we had to go out and grab it, but yeah. um, a lot of times they didn't want to come out and hang out with us because it was, it was too dangerous. Yeah. So it was a, a five-plus-hour uh, engagement Um in terms of kind of your your guys's movements, were you trying to get from one point to the next, or or like how did how did the general overview of what happened? Uh, what did that look like? We we had to conduct localized security patrols and flush out the bad guys. Almost what had happened in the city once we had we would push through a, a zone, we'd find the best location, the best house, the highest position a bank, whatever we could take and we'd own it. And then we'd operate out of there and we lived in the city with the people. And that was, that was a challenge, but you could only own so much real estate in that city uh, because there were so many other units operating in there and you had to have clear boundaries and these imaginary fences built around your positions. And you know, this, you can't cross into someone else's yard without asking permission first. So that was that was a real challenge as well. But we were patrolling at night almost exclusively after the first incident and then a couple of several um, near misses during daytime patrols. We just I just said, no, we own the night. Let's just operate at night. And as we did that, we got engaged. Uh, we got in some pretty decent firefights. But from a clearance operation standpoint, it really allowed me as a commander to gather intelligence interact with the locals trust me they didn't like getting woken up at two or three in the morning when we'd be knocking on their doors but we had to do that and we also when i say we i mean me had a policy where i didn't allow any weapons to be left behind and the marines hated me for it <laughs> i mean they, they i'm sure they called me worse things uh but in addition to the 80 pounds of body armor water ammo and their own personal weapons they were carrying when we clear through these sections of town and there were ak-47s rpgs munitions it all had to come with us so there was either slinging them on there and then if they're carrying all this extra gear and they got in another firefight they'd have to fight through that drop it so it was very cumbersome and yeah. i'm sure they hated me for it but just took a lot of shit off the street though, we took man. a ton of weapons and ammunition and it probably didn't even put a dent into what was there but it was a strange uh, benefit that the, the more houses we cleared and the more weapons we confiscated, the less we got shot at during the day. Yeah. It was interesting how that worked out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, yet there were still some commanders there, Mike, that said, Oh, Iraqi law says you can't, they can own one AK 47. And I said, no, they cannot. And that's when I went back to my time in the palace in Baghdad, having understood and, and reading some of the documents that they were preparing from the coalition provisional authority, it did not say that. And I actually happen to know that and I'm not a lawyer, but I had read that during that deployment and I shared that with, I said, no, we have to take all the weapons. Yeah. I mean, to me, irrespective of that, um, you know, like I, I, I wouldn't shit on anybody's right to do that, but if you're being engaged by somebody, they can fuck themselves with, uh, with owning that, you know, like if you, t if you take over a, a compound or a target, you know, that you're being actively engaged from, then yeah, like to me, that seems pretty reasonable that you could take. It's uh, take it's a little shot. different if you want to make a, a <clears throat> Second Amendment comparison here in the United States because there is absolutely no identification process in Iraq. There, yeah. Drivers licenses, state IDs, and let's not even get into weapons registration. It's non-existent. Yeah. So I'm all about Second Amendment. I I love. Uh, our constitution, but 
in that environment, the problem was is we're just smarter than those guys. Yeah. Not that they weren't smart, yeah. but what was happening was they were using all of these local houses with with contraband weapons. And it, I, th I think I wrote a, a bit in the book about it where we went into this house and there's this old lady. And whose weapon is this? We found a bunch of weapons. She's, oh, they're mine. Yeah. It's, you're 70 years old. She couldn't yeah. even pull the, the bolt to the rear and lock yeah. it. And yeah. She had no idea. But the insurgents were using the local populace through threats, murder, and intimidation. Yeah. And they would stage weapons and ammunition in all these houses along our patrol routes. And when it was advantageous to them, they'd slip in, they'd take a few shots, hopefully kill one of our guys, slip back out. But before they'd leave, they'd say, if you tell anybody that we were here, we will come back and kill you. Yeah. So the locals didn't have a whole lot of incentive, as you know, to, yeah, to help us out when we rolled in. Yeah, I mean, all those uh, poor folks were in between a rock and a hard place in, in so many ways there. Um, is there a uh, a mission that you went off uh, went on that stands out as uh, being the the hairiest uh, during that deployment? That's a good question. Like from a from a close call standpoint, uh, I had a, I had a lot of close calls. I was I was pretty lucky, and uh, I always share the story. My buddy, uh, Colonel John McKay, he's a Vietnam vet. Uh, it's got a patch. He looks really badass. And uh, we, were, we were sharing stories like this too. And he said when he was in Vietnam and he got into the really heavy fighting, he, he looked around and I, I can remember this feeling too. He says, man, why are people shooting at me? I'm a nice guy. Like, I don't know why people <laughs> want to shoot and kill me. Yeah. But there were, there were plenty of times where uh, I, I had some, I had some pretty close calls, but again, I, I, I I wasn't thinking about, oh, man, that was a close call. It, you're in survival mode. You're trying to get through the day to live, but you're also trying to protect the, the Marines on your left and right. And those guys always took care of me. I, I, I think that you could have a lot of metrics of success as a leader, but I think the one that we use in our community is my pack always made it on the truck. Yeah. So I must have been doing something right. So the Marines yeah. always knew the boss was out <laughs> you know, doing something, but – and my gear would be left as the last one, but they always made sure my gear was on the truck. So yeah. that, that was like my big yeah. win, yeah. I think, or, or measurement of as being a successful leader. But the the, in, the intensity of the fighting in, in Ramadi, I mean, it was it, there were so many, like so many during the day. It, if I wrote a book about all of that, it'd be so long and so boring, no one would have ever read it. And the same yeah. thing for the Marines. I, I would have loved to have written about every single one of those guys. And that would have been a long book. Yeah. But I think that the people that I wrote about in the interviews I did, over 100 interviews with the family and the Marines and soldiers, I, th those are the people that are emblematic of what everybody does, what you did, what everybody who's fought and served has done. And I think that it was important for me to hear it from them to make sure that my memory was right because it had been 10 years which was honestly the perfect time because had I set pen to paper right after we got back, that story would not have been the same. Yeah. But the best part of it was that the people that I wrote about that shared their memories had time to decompress yeah. and were at a point in their life 10 years later that they wanted to share. Yeah. And I think that that came through. And although the book, has this Marine on the cover looks like he's going to kick your door in and do bad things in the middle of the night, which we do uh, and are trained to do. It's also a story about people and leadership and team building and overcoming adversity and all of these things that we endured, not just on the battlefield, but as you know, coming home yeah. and a lot of the tragedy and this crisis in our veteran community of guys killing themselves. Yeah. It's uh, something that, very personal to me, uh, having lost six guys, and that doesn't even include the dozens of other personal friends we know that have, have taken their own lives and killed themselves. And that story and my experience in Ramadi and all of the fighting and, and what, the, what the people have to deal with afterwards, I think, is really what that book is about. And 
I've been grateful for the fact that it's also propelled me into what we do in the nonprofit world to continue to help our veteran community. It's essential. And I think that that's a real part of being a leader too, is that there's no expiration date on my commission. Yeah. And it's something I'm very fortunate to be able to do and have the capacity to continue to lead, not just staying tied to the active duty military, but our veteran community, the nonprofit sector, uh, very grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, a huge part of, I think, a successful transition out is maintaining that, uh, that mentality, no doubt. Um, in some of the close calls that, uh, that you had many of, was it a combination of small arms, RPGs, IEDs, or, or was it primarily one of the three or, or how did that kind of shake down? Like what were some of the experiences where you're like, holy shit. It could have been a combination of everything you just talked about. We had vehicles that were blown up from subsurface mines that were improvised. And we had days where they would throw hand grenades. We had rocket attacks, RPGs, um, medium and small arms fire, uh, machine gun fire. They, they were very hit and run tactics for most of the firefights that we were in in Ramadi. The protracted uh, gun battles like December 6th um, and, and some other ones that lasted uh, for a significant period of time were, they were memorable, but not the, not the norm. Yeah. I, I think from a, from a day-to-day basis, again, we, we were, we, when I say we, my company exclusively, this doesn't even include all of the thousands of others from the Army, Navy SEALs, all those guys that were in, in town with us fighting, every we were getting engaged five, six times a day. That means like an enemy round was pointed at us. It either hit a building, a vehicle, or a person. That happened all the time, every day. So multiply that times every position in the city of a city of over 300,000 people where everybody's got their little section carved out. Everybody was getting in the mix. So it wasn't as if they was a lack of fighting in that town. Yeah. Was, um, was there a standard, uh, operation as far as we would go out, uh, like from a tactic standpoint, um, let's say you're going out on a, on a patrol and you receive contact, even if it's a hit and run from that point, are you guys breaking contact and getting away from it? Or would you guys engage and, and move forward and try to find them, neutralize them, capture them, kill them, et cetera? Kill them. And so we, pretty much every time you're engaged, you would chase. I don't know if I, I don't want to paint a picture where guys would get shot and they just take off sprinting. Oh, it, yeah. it wasn't that for, for anyone who's ever, hasn't been there. I'm explaining it's like, we weren't out of the starting blocks, like chasing them, but we would develop a, a plan to normally pin them down. Uh, and the, the other problem too, when you're working in the city like that, it's really hard to bring the, the leverage and the effectiveness of, of air power to bear because of the collateral damage. Uh, you can't drop a bomb or shoot a rocket into a building if you don't know there's a family in it or next door. So we would normally try and isolate them and then uh, you know close on the objective. And then if they were inside a structure, you have to go room by room and you have to root them out. A lot of times they'd just give up and they'd fake as if they lived there and play dumb, put their hands up, we'd wrap them up, cuff them, stuff them, and they get processed by the PSYOPs team that the Army needed to do interrogations or send them to jail. Because normally we would find them with a weapon that they were had a hot barrel and you know, IED making material or so, something in the house. But the, the, the plan which differed from the Army's was we wanted to be aggressive. And that was what I told all of my, my, my subordinate leaders was we have to get out and get after them. Mm-hmm. Like we, and, and even in retrospect, I think <clears throat> you always question, it's really not about a question of what you did. Like writing about all of these uh, firefights or all the engagements that we did. And, you know, I was doing a uh, engagement recently and I was thinking about this because guys were talking about, trauma and war and it's really not about the things you did it's it's really about the things that you wish you had done those regrets you know 
could I have chased more? Could I have patrolled more? Could I have engaged more with the locals? Uh, all of those things, I think, have recently been something that I've been thinking about critically. Yeah. Is, is, is that a causal factor, too, of, of veteran suicide? I don't know. Uh, is it the regret for what you didn't do or what you actually saw? Yeah. I don't know. But it, it differs vastly for everybody that fights. And it, the, the people that do the type of fighting that we do, too, are such a very small percentage. Not, I'm not saying this is some sort of exclusivity, Mike. And you know this, is that the military in and of itself is one half of 1% of the American population. And then you've got every service branch. You've got the Marines, 200,000. And within that, you've got the infantry. And then within the infantry, you've got the guys that go to combat. And then the guys that are in combat who are actually doing that type of fighting, that percentage gets bigger or, or smaller and smaller every time you go down one of those rungs. Yeah. So how the how those guys reacted with that type of fighting at such a young age, that also is a question that I, I think I've been fortunate to, to understand it more, is how you do that type of fighting for a sustained period with the intensity and the effects how do you process that trauma? How do you process all that as an 18, 19 year old kid? I was a 35 year old <laughs> captain yeah. with a couple of deployments under my belt and a lot of life experience. But when you take a, a young man or woman and you put them in under those circumstances, it wasn't until I, I started writing Echo and Ramadi that I, I made myself think, I know how I process this. How are these guys dealing with it? Yeah. It's, it's a totally different animal. Yeah. As you guys know, uh, health and fitness is a big part of my daily routine and my lifestyle. I have a number of guests that come on that, uh, you know, that we talk about all, all sorts of things, health and fitness related, uh, diet, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, I started taking athletic greens a few months ago here uh, for that reason is that it's a uh, all, all encompassing vitamin and mineral supplement, 75 vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you do keto, paleo, vegan, it's dairy-free, gluten-free, uh, less than one gram of sugar. There's no uh, GMOs or nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything in it. Uh, and it's just very nutrient-dense and uh, and gives you that, that supplementation that you need to combat cold and flu season coming up to bolster your immune system uh, and just help with a, with a healthy lifestyle. Um, right now, the, the subscription, if you sign up for it, comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which, again, uh, is, is crucial to uh, immune support as well as five uh, on-the-go packets uh, with that first purchase. Um, whether you want to invest in, in your health or just supplement an, an already existing protocol that you have, uh, Athletic Greens has been a, a phenomenal staple uh, that I've added into my regimen, and I couldn't be happier to be working with them. Uh, if you want in on that deal, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop, um, and they, they do a phenomenal job at uh, all the things that uh, health and fitness um, wise need to be done on a daily basis. So check them out. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop, and they will hook you up with that uh, special deal. No, it is. And it's, you know, the unfortunate reality of uh, veteran suicide is, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to understand the why when, when that happens, because there's, there's no way to, to find that out, you know, um, uh, from a, I guess from an operational standpoint, uh, I know that that was a, a absolute hotbed uh, during that time when you were there, and it was probably or arguably the biggest show in town as far as legit combat. Um, and I know that there were a lot of other special operations there. Did you guys ever go out with other soft groups uh, on on specific missions, like uh, accompany them as a either a blocking force or Overwatch or? Yeah, they, they were always in the scheme of maneuver. Uh, we always knew where they were at on the map. We, we did some major clearance operations where uh, we we always set the conditions. That And I, I always like to remind guys, and, and I have a lot of great friends that are Navy SEALs and, and MARSA guys, like, hey, just remember who yeah. sets the conditions yeah. for you guys to operate on the battlefield without it, with yeah. impunity. Yeah. And we did that. And, 
and it's all part of a teamwork. Everybody's got their role. Everybody knows what they need to do. So when we would do that, you know, when I have the, am wielding a, a club with 258 Marines and I got a section of tanks attached to me, I got vehicle support and I've got a captain who's a pilot controlling aircraft, we can establish that perimeter and, and clear and zone and set those conditions where the guys from SEAL team, uh, you know, that were in town with us that worked for Task Force 1 and Infantry and the, and the Brigade Combat Team, we were always in comms with those guys. Uh, we always had a great working relationship. And I was always very unabashed to include everybody on my team that could carry a rifle. Yeah. You could be a contractor. Army, PSYOPs, Civil Affairs Group, anybody that wanted to get in the fight, if they had a rifle and they were, tra they were trained, yeah. I'd send them over to see Tom Foster, and I'd say, Tom, these guys put him with one of the platoons. He's like, oh, you're killing me, sir. So our numbers grew and grew and grew. <laughs> but I saw no reason, no usefulness for all of these people sitting in these camps to be doing nothing yeah. when everybody that was there wanted to get out and fight. And they were all enablers. They, they all really enhanced what we did going out there and one of the biggest ones aside from interpreters and explosive ordnance guys were my dogs yeah. and i know you can appreciate this the dog teams that we had were instrumental in they one they loved finding explosive stuff i yeah. mean we, we had bomb sniffing dogs so they were always rooting stuff out the handlers were great but there just wasn't enough of them to go around if if you could set the table of organization for how to conduct a war going back to that same war we needed more interpreters we needed more explosive guys and we needed more dogs and you yeah. know what else we needed more of females yeah absolutely at the ground at the ground level yeah did uh were any of the dogs dual purpose any of them bite dogs or were they all single purpose bomb dogs they were i think they were dual purpose i know i know there was there was one uh malinois that we had that he looked as sweet as a pea, man, but <laughs> if you went near him, he would rip your face off just yeah. soon, give you the time of day. Were, I guess, were there any missions that you guys had dogs on that they went out? We and never let them off leash, yeah. Yeah, that, that, I re, yeah, that I recall. Yeah. Um, under my watch, we never never sick the dogs on them. Yeah. We normally didn't like, there, there were some pretty close fights, but normally uh, we like to our weapons yeah but but they feared the dogs too I oh mean, yeah in that culture dogs are filthy creatures and yeah. they didn't respect them and uh i remember on the the deployment i had in baghdad we had a one of the patrol bases we had set up there was a guard check set up and the, the dogs were back there to sniff the vehicles and there was interpreters there too but and they didn't want anything to do with the dogs cultural thing that we just didn't understand but it got so hot that ultimately i saw the iraqi interpreters and the dogs with the crates stacked up inside, all enjoying the air conditioning yeah. <laughs> of the little shack that they had yeah. out there. So yeah, everybody's funny. flexible to a degree, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the heat uh, that that kind of heat will force you to do some shit yeah. for sure. Were there any uh, operations that you recall that um, that a dog you you would say tangibly saved your guys's lives or or any of your men's lives? I can't say that on that scene, I know your story too and, and the, the Marine Patrol you were out with, but I, I, I can't cite a specific one where that dog found a subsurface IED, halted the unit in place, it was discovered and then defeated. Um, we, we never witnessed that. That's not saying that, again, having those dogs out there, that when you're, when you're patrolling through a city that size and the dog hits – and you start chipping away and you start pulling out hundreds of pieces of munition, <clears throat> uh, weapons, communication devices, all of that would have ultimately been used against us. Yeah. So yeah. you give the dog the credit, toss him a bone. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the tricky parts. Yeah. It's hard to, I mean, shy of like that super easy to grasp, hey, we were patrolling and this dog indicated here, we backed up and it turned out it was a booby trap and what, like that's pretty pretty easy to wrap your arms around but yeah there's like so so many of the it never happened because we had the dog with us or you know they found this huge cache of uh, munitions or bomb making material or whatever that that was uh, you know sto stored away or, or what have you it's, it's impossible to know you know what what that impact is other than that you know it's significant and worthwhile but um, you guys were in Ramadi for what 10 months 
ish. Uh, no, not not ten months. We were there. We were in Ramadi for a couple months, and then my company got pushed over to Western Al Anbar to Rupa, and then we cleared that city. John Smith and Fox Company stayed in Ramadi, and then they actually pushed to uh, I think Jaleba to the Fish Hook and set up a firm base over there. And so that was interesting too because we were basically pulled away our two companies and then i heard reports after we had left months after that they were actually doing a fun run down around michigan i'm not kidding you <laughs> like a 5k fun run down oh, around michigan shit. i called I, I, it might have been jared norell the opso from 19 infantry i said you got to confirm or deny this for me man i said did this really happen he says yep they're driving down the streets again. They had like outdoor activities, no body armor. And to think that that could happen, honestly, it was uh, kind of cool yeah. because we really turned the tide of the war. Yeah. And, and that in, in the spring of 07, things had really started to diminish from a kinetic standpoint from steel on steel across the entire country. Yeah. There's still a lot of bad people there. There's still a lot of fighting going on, but it was not anything. I don't think after 07, um, we had anything resembling that type of fighting in Iraq. Yeah. yeah. When, uh, how did the fighting differ when you went from Ramadi to, uh, to the al Amber province out West? Two totally separate cities. So you've got uh, the... The capital of Al Anbar province, Ramadi, uh, which is the, their crowning jewel. And then you've got Baghdad, the capital um, to the east. All the way uh, to the Syrian border in Iraq, you've got this town called Rutba. And it's like a truck stop. That's the best way I describe it. It was like a truck stop for terrorists. There wasn't really any infrastructure. There was some schools or a few markets, some internet cafes. And there was a gas station. But... It was a, a great point on the map for them to ferry weapons and, and fighters through that because there was that main road that ran all the way from the west side of the country to the, to the east, and that was what we called the Americans Route Michigan. It was the main supply route. So they would transit that. Uh, it was one of the best uh, throughputs for them to get weapons, gas, fuel, and... Most people don't understand this either in Western culture. <laughs> that even though gas is free in Iraq, they would fist fight for a gallon of gas and they'd wait all day in line to fill up their car plus the eight gallons of gasoline they had in the trunk. So um, that, that transition from the fighting, for the most part, the rules of engagement were different. The command was different that we fought under. I was back under the command of my colonel. But the, the rules of engagement were a lot more restrictive. Uh, we, we had to use more kid gloves. And then at the higher level too, Mike, there was uh, some political stuff going on where they were wanting to take off the iron fist and slide on the velvet glove and have this gentler feel. That was all transitioning. And we were being affected by that and those decisions at that level at the tactical level. Yeah. Because what we might have construed as being a bad act or a, a potential bad act in Ramadi that needed action taken. We couldn't do that in Rupa. Yeah. It was, it was just vastly different. And as we cleared the city um, and it was me and I, I don't say it wasn't just echo company. It was another, another Marine unit that reconnaissance unit that was there, Stan Hawk who fought on my flank and then other elements from the, our Marine recon brothers with the Mew I developed the plan in, in concert with uh, MU operations officer Paul Nugent. We executed it, and it took us a little longer than we hoped. Uh, we took a lot of, you know, a few casualties. I lost two Marines to sniper fire, killed in action. Um, so, uh, I mean, were you, it sounds like I mean, you guys were still mixing it up pretty heavy out west. We did for the for, for the clearance for the for the initial clearance operation that we had planned, and we went through, and when we owned that part of the city. We could start going out, interacting with the locals and, and fighting uh, at night. It needed, But once we cleared that city, man, it was crickets. We, we came in and, and fought so hard. and uh, But it, it, it was such a different type of fight. Um, 
How? Uh, what was the biggest difference? I think f- figuring out who was fighting us. I think it was a bunch of entrenched fighters or transients, and we could never really get uh, a good read from our, even from our intelligence analysts uh, that were on the ground with us and the psyops and the human exploitation teams. They knew who was out there, but again, because that that city was like a truck stop, they were in and out of there all the time. So as we were, as we were fighting trying to clear the city and really stake a, a flag in the ground for where we wanted to live. Is, and this town wasn't that big. I, I don't even remember what the population was, but it was tiny. Uh, it was a tiny little town. And once we had taken the ground that we wanted to in the buildings that we wanted to set up on and operate out of, it was quiet. There were a few firefights. They'd like to shoot at us as we were out doing daytime patrols. But the war was transitioning to the point where commanders and specialists and civilians were having to do tribal engagements, um, political engagements with uh, their officials. And I wrote about this as well in the book, but it was very galling to me to see these, at times, full colonels and general officers sitting down having negotiations talking about infrastructure and waste management and educational systems when the same colonel, and I'm not saying this to as no slight on rank, probably had a criminal justice degree like me. Yeah. He doesn't have a degree in civil management or civil engineering or waste management. Yeah. It was just an, a <clears throat> result of looking again at the administrative level, the strategic level beneath that, not having a real solid plan for this transition in Iraq or Afghanistan for that matter. But what I was seeing in 07 was senior military officers sitting down with uh, senior tribal leaders or elected officials in these towns talking about these things that were so far removed from what was most important, the security, to bring in the right people to do the right job for the right reason. And instead, you have this interaction going on. And by the way, the person he's sitting across the table with the, the Iraqi local probably has the education, the formal education of a second grader yeah. by American standards. I'm not saying that to disparage anyone of Iraqi descent or anyone living in Iraq. They're very smart people. They're very steeped in culture and they're very good at what they, they can do within their towns because it's all life experience. That's where their education comes from. It's not through a lack of wanting to be educated, but that's what they were dealing with. Yeah. So, it was a vastly different environment, um, but at, at the same time, you know, we lost lost two Marines, uh, Emilian Sanchez and, and uh, Andrew Matus. You know, they were young kids, and we there was a sniper threat in the town, and um, there wasn't when we left. Yeah. Um, do you have a biggest takeaway from uh, from that deployment? Just be a good listener to those you lead. It's probably my biggest one because we had so many great Marines again at every level that I I didn't have the entire day to sit and listen to all the Marines bitch and complain or make great idea suggestions. I, I would have been completely ineffective as a commander if I did that. But I think that, I tried to listen, as in, and if I had to go back, uh, I'd try harder. Yeah. 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 Um, the title, Echo and Ramadi, what uh, what does that stem from? It's interesting because when my publisher, um, who's an editor, is also a really good friend of mine, uh, questioned me about the title. So no, no one's going to know what this means. No one, no one knows what Ramadi is. So yeah, but it's Echo Company, Second Battalion, Fourth Marines, and it's obviously a play on words. You know the echoes of war and what resonates and is left behind that we deal with. And so I tell you what, there was a time in American history when people didn't know words like Guadalcanal or Iwo Jima. Those words looked weird on the cover of a book. I said, but they're very important. Yeah, they're important to all the guys I wrote about. They're important to me. And luckily, it uh, <laughs> worked out well. Yeah. The book uh, is done very well, and and I think they don't regret listening to my advice on yeah. that. But I felt like I owed it a little bit to the guys, and 
uh, I was flexible on uh, some of the other stuff when it comes to writing a book, but yeah, I think it is an important piece of American history. And although I wrote the book to honor the the spirit and the sacrifice of all those guys that that fought alongside me, um, it was also a very important part historically in military history that I didn't want the Battle of Ramadi to fall under the shadows of Baghdad or Kandahar or Fallujah, be all the very significant battles, but. The fighting that was done in Ramadi, uh, again, redefined what we knew about urban fighting. And there's a, I won't say it's an, it's an argument, but it's a, it's a, a differentiation in how this war was labeled, this battle. There's um, um, some academic discussion of the first battle of Ramadi, which was 04. And then there's the second battle of Ramadi, which was 06, 07. I submit to others that want to have this discussion that it is one battle of Ramadi and it's a protracted battle. It's a two year battle, almost three years where within that time frame, you've got almost single units fighting in that city, poking around from Oh four and getting some real heavy fighting. And there's this sine wave of highs and lows in the fighting throughout that period that I don't think have really been clearly articulated in a historical book. My book is about people. I, I, I didn't want to report and have some chronology or military anthology. That wasn't what I wanted to write about. I wanted to write about the people. But I think it's an interesting uh, academic discussion to figure out how that battle should really be encapsulated because I do think it was a, it was a long battle. And we look at that, it's, it's almost hard to believe that one battle in one city could last that long, but it did. And I compare that to other battles from... Let's just say the Vietnam War. Let's say my battalion. Yeah. Two Medal of Honor recipients, Jay Vargas, Jim Livingston, whose name is on my book, who wrote the, a beautiful foreword to my book, fought in the Battle of Dido in Vietnam in, in 1968. Three days. Yeah. Three days. So it, I'm always amazed, too, when I talk to Vietnam vets or World War II vets, they, they always want to pull all this information from us, like, what was it like fighting in Fallujah? What was it like fighting in Iraq? And all I want to do is turn the table around and, and say, what was it like being on Iwo Jima? Or, yeah. Because their experience is so different. They, it, it's hard for them to understand how long we were fighting. Yeah. I, yeah it's a sustained combat it, it, for years. It's, re, it's really interesting when I talk to those guys. Yeah, yeah it is. That's fascinating. Um, when you got home from, uh, from that, that deployment, um, what was what was kind of the next steps and like for the rest of your your career as it relates to combat? What what did that look like? Well, I think uh, I was pretty happy to yeah. <laughs> made it out of that home. deployment in one piece and uh, bring as many guys home with me as I could. Um, you, know, I think, I think I did two or three three. I don't know how many deployments I did after that, but uh, I. You know, I was always always willing to go back, and but I think that again, the the war had changed so much. I honestly didn't really have the desire to. Honestly, I was tired of getting shot at. Yeah, it, the romance of all that on the big screen, uh, although it's appealing to some young eighteen, nineteen year old kids, really lost its luster for me. Um, but throughout the rest of my career, I think that what was interesting is understanding your relevance in the big picture, not only as a leader or in your job field, whether it's EOD, your canine infantry, uh, aviation, whatever it is, uh, I, I transitioned back um, pretty successfully and then uh, went on to another unit as an instructor. Uh, basically, the Marine Corps version of Top Gun that the Navy has uh, in Yuma, Arizona, and what was interesting, too, was, uh, I'll go back to that word relevancy, is it diminishes rapidly in the military, especially in combat, mm -hmm. where we would conduct two of these courses per year. Very elite uh, group of, of aviators and support personnel that come through, and I was the token grunt to basically teach pilots how not to drop bombs on the guys on the ground. It was obviously a little more graduate level than that, but I'd look out into the audience and they'd all be wearing their service C uniforms with their ribbons on it. And every class that rolled through in almost three years out of school, those ribbons got smaller and smaller. 
yeah. and you, you were losing a lot of that uh, resident knowledge. So there was a point where I transitioned back from this and now I'm teaching this course and it was almost like I'm preaching to the choir. Had a lot of good TTPs as a guy on the ground to teach the pilots on how to control aircraft. But at the end of the, at the end of that uh, tour, the resident knowledge was almost with the entire instructor cadre. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So you, you, you can't use certain terms. Uh, the training venues change, uh, how you fight the weapons, the technology changes, the programs of record or the platforms you use to communicate change. So it's about an 18 month cycle, I think is what I kind of figured out that again, oh. that sine wave of, you know, where is the median and what really important part of that is that median. What are you teaching along that median? Mm -hmm. Like you could, you could, teach how to kick doors in and, and marksmanship and this, or you could teach administration down here, but what's the median? Yeah. What, what was the most important thing that we needed to be teaching these future leaders that were going to go back into combat? And we did that as well. And we were so tuned into that. We got a, we got a lessons learned trip together and we like went back to Afghanistan in 2009. We said, we got to figure out what's going on here. How is this war changing? And I think that that is something that, the Marine Corps is really good at. Definitely our special forces are, are very adaptable at that. Um, but right now, big Marine Corps, big Army, I, I think there's a lot of changes right now with technology and what is coming on the on the horizon. And I, I'm pretty proud to say that the Marine Corps has a plan with their, their force uh, development plan, and they, they look at least – seven, eight years ahead of that, and, yeah. and they plan for that. And I think that there's a lot of criticism in the service branches, the Marine Corps especially, with what senior leadership is doing as far as reshaping the force, how they're managing talent to keep the right people in the right jobs for the right reasons. Um, but I think that improvement's great, Nobody, but no one likes change. Yeah. What, uh, what year did you get out? I retired in 2013. Between 9 and 13, did you do any uh, Afghan or Horn of Africa deployments? The, uh, we did the, we did the, I was in Afghanistan in that lessons learned trip. And then as the Mew operations officer, we were in the Horn, Djibouti, um, Bahrain, you know, doing the standard CENTCOM package um, and doing the, doing the training over there. But that, that Mew, uh, we were doing some other tactical operations in support of, combat operations in theater yeah. uh, use, using some of the resources we had. <clears throat> Did, uh, any, any good mix it up uh, excursions during the Horn of Africa trip? No, it was pretty, pretty quiet over there. Yeah. yeah it was pretty quiet over there at that yeah. time. But again, th those are the things when you're operating as a, as a Marine expeditionary unit with Navy Marine Corps team and air power is it's that presence yeah. and all of the things that may seem less sexy and being in combat, doing the theater security cooperation exercises with the French, or the Djiboutians, or whoever the country is that you got to get in bed with and play nice with and make them feel like a better military, make them feel like they're not the 34th pick uh, on the draft. <laughs> on or dodgeball. Whatever. Yeah, but those those are important things too. And uh, you got to take some some solace in that, man, as a, yeah. as a guy that makes it up the, the ranks too is yeah. – you're not going to get all that instant feedback uh, for, for what sure. you're doing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, was there a a pivotal moment that made you decide, okay, it's time for me to pull chalks, or was it more gradual? I told myself I will do this uh, until it stops being fun. Yeah, and that was that was kind of always my my, my bar that I set. And <clears throat> after the Iraq uh, and Ramadi deployment. Um, I'd suffered some some physical injuries, some impact related injuries, and uh, the Navy did their best to patch me up and put some extra duct tape, hardware, and, and stuff <laughs> in my spine to keep me standing straight. But it's a young man's game, and uh, I was I was already a little be you know a little older than the average bear, like I said when I when I started. But I thought. You know, in, in fairness, too, to the Marines I would ultimately command at the battalion or regimental level, like I, you have to be 
one hundred percent. I mean, at least close to it. And and I really felt that I I had done so much and deployed so much, and I, I was feeling it physically, um, especially from the impact the the the, the medical advice to me was you should you should probably hang it up i didn't have to medically retire i just retired yeah and you know i, I went out to operationally uh, as uh you know being with the marine expeditionary unit again for deployed um doing what we're great at and being in a position where i could really you know make a big impact was was pretty cool and i had a great boss too that you know he understood he understood what i'd been through and uh and what i w- what i was great at as a planner and and what my what my skill was managing people and you know being able to deploy marines from an expeditionary afloat unit to seven different countries at night safely in so many different weather conditions and working with joint services like that was a cool part of the job so people ask me you probably get this question do you miss it what do you tell people I mean, for me, I, I miss working with the, the caliber of guys that, that I worked with. You know, there are parts of the job that I miss. Uh, there's some of the culture of just being in that environment, uh, you know, that I miss. There's a, a point in my life aspect of it that I miss because I was a, a young man. And, uh, you know, but ultimately, like, it's a, a chapter in my life that, uh, that I look back fondly on and, and uh, would never take back. But I'm also glad to be where I'm at now, you know? So, uh, I don't know that I would characterize it as I miss it, um, because I, I wouldn't want to be still doing it at the age that I am now anyway. Uh, you know, and again, I like, I, I like what I've done since and, and I'm, I feel pretty good about where I'm at now, you know? So, um, I, you know, ultimately, no, I don't, I, I miss the guys, I miss the job, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, I don't know. How do you answer it? Pretty much the same. I, I, I miss the enormity of all the stuff we got to, to yeah. play with. Yeah. And riding around in tanks and yeah, launching I mean, you, off of amphibs when helos yeah. and fast roping and, and that's that's fun stuff. But yeah. and, and the and the people are great. but see I don't miss the people because I'm still very connected to them. I, yeah. I mean I'm sitting here right now. We could we could sit around and name drop and tell war stories and vet stories and all the dudes we know. And I, I still work with active duty units in the nonprofit space and the, in the veteran service organizations we're tied into. It's two degrees of separation, literally between me and you, we were talking yeah. about this for the show. Like how did this thread work again? Oh, got it. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's certainly been part of why I maybe don't miss it the way some guys do is kind of similarly through uh, you know, through the canine world that, you know, like I, I still talk with and, and do a lot of the same things. You know, I, I went back as a trainer uh, for the SEAL Team Canine program after I got out, you know, so it was like still having a lot of connectivity with those guys certainly uh, plays a big role in that. Um, but, you know, I think it's still not the same as being 25 and traveling the world and getting paid to do shit that, um, you know, billionaires can't pay to do you know so it, it's just uh yeah it's just kind of a once in a lifetime thing that that again like i i i'm super glad that i did it and and i look fondly on it but uh my body thanks me for not not doing it still that's Absolutely. for sure it's uh it's cursing me for doing it in the first place but glad that i'm not still doing it um uh, so once once you got out did you go right into um working with a nonprofit or what what was kind of the tr- your transition period like I think I was mentally prepared to transition. Uh, I I started job search. I, I also knew that I had to allocate time while I was on active duty to set myself up for success. Long story short, I wound up getting a job while I was still on terminal leave, and I, I, I started work. It was great. Uh, I loved working, and it was in L.A. It was with the um, in the security field as an executive uh, doing what I was great at right you know developing training and you know managing people and it uh came to a point where it was again where if it's, if it's not fun you got to do something else so i transitioned again and I, I really believe that too as veterans especially guys like me uh, or even you with 12 years in the navy man that's a long chunk of your life of your adult life and you think man i got to do this next thing 
for 24 years or 12 years. No, you don't. You do it for a year, transition again. You don't like that? Transition again. Yeah. I don't, and I think even if you get fired from a job, that's a great learning curve. Yeah. And you apply that to the next thing you want to transition to. So I, my transition was pretty easy, but then there was a point where I said, you know, I, I want to do something else. So I cashed it all in and, and I decided to start writing, lock myself in my studio. And that's how this journey right in Echo Ramadi. And I never thought I'd be doing that. I'd always written. I've always been an artist my whole life, but um, to really figure out the process and how to do it, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And now to be in a position where not only as a writer um, to share what I've learned as a writer and how to get a book out there in the, in both the mainstream publishing world and maybe self publishing to people that are interested in that I am happy to share that knowledge with people it, almost to the point where it's uh, it become too much for me to handle. Yeah. And I have to say, no, that's, that's a challenge too. Yeah. Le leading 250 Marines in combat is easy. Leading yourself every morning and, and being able to say no to everybody that wants to pull something from you yeah. uh, and get it for free. That's tough. <clears throat> it's, it's really tough. I yeah. Mean, especially because when you first start out, <laughs> you know, almost through new set through necessity, you, you kind of have to say yes to everything, you know, because it's like, fuck, I, I don't know if this opportunity is going to present itself. I know at least for me, it was, it was, I'll say yes to everything. Like any opportunity that, that popped up, I jumped on it, but then, you know, you get to a point where that starts to, to burn you out. And, and as success continues to grow and multiply, you get to a point where uh, now it's like, okay, now I, I need to look at it more, I mean, really, like from a business decision standpoint, like from a cost benefit standpoint of, hey, what juice being worth the squeeze? What's the the top four or five things that I need to be focused on or what uh, what have you? Uh, in terms of, you know, once you um, separated and, and kind of got your feet on the ground, at what point did you um, get involved in the, in the nonprofit and how did that kind of shake out? Well, I had always stayed pretty closely connected to a lot of the guys that served under my command. And not just Echo 2-4, but 24 years in the Marines. It's a lot of units. Uh, but I've been really fortunate. And like many things that we deal with, again, born through tragedy, um, one of my squad leaders who fought under my command, Simon Lickie, killed himself oh, no in sure. Minnesota. We found out word <clears throat> spread really fast, and um, Nick Velez, who was one of my young machine gunners, uh, he says, hey, sir, we want to fly some guys up to help support the family in Minnesota. So we did. Then we came back, and this was in this, this was in the spring of um, 2015, and uh, you know, we were just sitting around, and Nick, who did all the paperwork and everything for the nonprofit, Save the Brave, he asked me to, he said, hey, I just, we just started this. We want, we'd like you to be the executive director if you think about it. So I did, and, and that was seven years ago. And the first thing we did after we said goodbye to Simon, we took some guys fishing. Seemed like a cool thing to do. California, off the coast, offshore fishing, and had them on a boat with some pros. And uh, yeah, we had, I think, 24 vets out on that boat. Um, Navy SEALs, Marines, uh, you name it. Um, that was seven years ago, one fishing trip. Last year, we had 32 fishing trips. Wow, that's awesome. So we're fishing in Huntington, San Diego, <coughs> Texas. Uh, in August? In, not in August. <laughs> uh, but the guys in Texas uh, are, are running trips out of uh South Padre and uh, Corpus, and we've been fishing in Mexico. We're expanding to the point where we want to get onto the East Coast too. But, uh, you know, our, our ethos is to connect, empower, and serve. That supports our mission. Because we don't want to be one of those veteran nonprofits, and there's over 45,000 veteran service organizations registered with the IRS. Some of them are doing great things. We're doing great things. Uh, we're doing our part. And, and we think that we are part of the solution, but we don't want to be in the position where we feel like we have to give somebody something for free or become 
some big ATM where we're solving people's financial problems. We want to show people that you can start a podcast as a veteran. You can write a bestseller. You can own a restaurant. You can do this. All these things to empower them. So all of the Marines and, and veterans that we bring in from all service branches, uh, we're, that's really the lesson we're doing. And in turn, they they come back and serve us. Yeah. They volunteer. They introduce people that need services or people in the network, and we share that. And I think that's probably been the one thing, the constant thing, I, I think, since I transitioned from, from the Marine Corps that's really given me the most pleasure. Everybody will ask me if writing a book and barfing your life into 300 pages to hang on you know, the shelves at Barnes & Noble or Amazon is some catharsis. It's not. It, 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 I think it's important. But I didn't hit the end on the typewriter and be like, oh, clarity. No, this really comes from everything we do at SaveTheBrave.org is connecting veterans in a safe space where they understand that it's not some boozy, smoke-filled VFW where they are forced to hear the same tired war stories over and over. I, we just don't like to do it. My commander's guidance to the whole team and Nick is in agreement with this. Everything that we do, whether it's a program, the offshore fishing program, uh, the jiu-jitsu program, it's got to be cool. It, it's got to be cool, and it's got to be uh, something that uh, hopefully it's physical. There's some sort of outdoor component to it that energizes people. Um, but we're also very proud that we started our scholarship program this year, and I'm keenly aware that when someone kills himself, I don't even like to say commit suicide. It sounds too sterile. When someone kills himself, they are leaving this wake of destruction behind. And there's a family that has to swim in it. So I said, we got to take care of the families. I said, let's start a scholarship program. And it took us a little while to get the funding. But this August, we were in San Francisco. And I presented a $10,000 check to Kayla Turner, uh, who's a junior at Cal State. Her, her dad... Eric was a Marine, committed suicide last year. And her uncle, Pete Turner, who's a dear, dear friend of mine, Army Hua, and uh, the creator of the Break It Down show podcast. Um, I couldn't think of anyone more deserving at that time. There were a couple applicants. But next year, uh, we're going to do two. And then the year after that, I'm going to do three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying to find a way to make an impact and, and change the lives of these, these kids that um, – Man, to go through life like that, yeah. you know, they just didn't sign up for that when, yeah. when their parents joined the military. And, you know, I, I think that looking back at my college career, as I described a little bit, is working full time and I, donating blood plasma on Tuesdays and Thursdays to get an extra 65 bucks. Yeah. Um, somebody would have handed me a check for 10,000 bucks, Mike. I don't know what that would have done for you, but... Yeah. It would have been transformational. I, I mean, it would have taken so much stress off of my college career. So through our organization and the support of um, a lot of great donors, uh, you know, we're going to continue to do that and just try and, again, just do our small part. Yeah. Uh, that's savethebrave.org, correct? Savethebrave.org. What, uh, what are the uh, details on the jiu-jitsu program? What's cool about this is this is a, a relatively new program. We started uh, two years ago where we partnered with a local studio, uh, Marine Vet, of course, um, Six Blades Jiu-Jitsu in, uh, in Southern California. And again, reached out to us and said, how can I help? My answer to that question for everybody is just be great at what you're great at. If it's plumbing Plum for veterans or donate a portion of plumbing supply, whatever you're great at. Just do that. Don't try and make work for me. Yeah. So when they came to us and said, hey, we <clears throat> want to start giving scholarships to veterans. Can we do that? I said, well, what's scholarship? Well, it's not just a free lesson because that doesn't really do you any good, but get you injured, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, get in, I don't get on the mats and roll with these guys. <laughs> They're all younger than me. But they're offering a scholarship, which is really kind of a cradle to grave program where they are not, it's almost like they're adopting them into the jujitsu community yeah. and taking them from that very first lesson all the way to whatever the highest belt level is that they want to attain or that's attainable. Yeah. 
That's awesome. And in doing so, we've also included our brand and our ethos about what we do for veterans, our logo and everything. We've got tournaments that have, you know, they've adopted our logos and it, it's just got a really cool feel to it. Again, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Guys like getting a gi with the Save the Brave logo on it and the guys wrestling and there's energy and it's awareness um, for how transformational that is to get to get out there and do those things and get people out of their comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. And we we're enabling them to put themselves in an uncomfortable position, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Getting their laundry folded yeah, with them cool. still it, inside. It is cool them. though. Yeah, that's awesome. But uh, it's uh, super important work what you guys do. I'm uh, uh, very impressed and, and proud to, to have met you and, and I can't support the, the mission that you have ongoing enough. So uh, thank you for your service and, and your continuation to do so. Same to you, brother. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you want to uh, bring up or add before we wrap up? Um, Funny joke. Anyway. <laughs> knock, knock. I don't do jokes. I'm pretty funny guy. That I, at most platforms, I'm usually talking about serious stuff, but I think most people behind the scenes would say like, yeah. I've, I'm, I don't know. You got a stand up career I, in your future? No, no stand up career, but uh, I do love going to see some comedy. We did yeah. a great comedy for a cause show too, for save the brave with, uh, Jay Moore and Brian Callen and Kevin yeah. McNamara. And it, it, we did it at the restaurant at Bastard's Canteen in, in Temecula, California. Oh, and, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Star started, but again, they're funny. They're way, way funnier than me. Yeah. But I just said, be great at what you're great at. And they said, yeah, I'll, I'll come do an act for free. Yeah, and and they, cool. they help become part of the solution as well, too. Yeah, awesome. Uh, it's I, I'll, I'll finish uh, by saying thanks, man. Because, oh, yeah. um, you know, this takes time. Everybody, it looks cool on Facebook and Instagram, but it's time yeah. out of your life and everyone's. But it's important stuff to, again, share uh, not only important historical stuff, but what are people doing now, man? Yeah. All that, all these coins and the medals, like that's what we did. Yeah. But what we're doing today and what we're going to be doing in the next five years, that's a message that I think that these younger guys need to hear as well. Yeah. Even these guys our age. Yeah. Uh, we got to keep agreed. sharing that because and that capacity diminishes and you start losing that voice and, and you got a strong one, brother. Um, it's important someone else carries the torch. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's a, a damn good way to wrap it up. Thanks again for coming. Uh, to the listener, uh, as always, I appreciate you guys tuning in uh, week after week. If you didn't, I wouldn't be able to uh, be in the fortunate position to be able to bring shows like this to you. So uh, as always, thank you guys. And until next time, this is Mike Drop. Mike Drop.